Hey there, fabulous ladies. Welcome to Bring Back Your Pink, where we celebrate the fabulousness of midlife and beyond. I am Jen B, your host, your biggest fangirl and impact-driven entrepreneur living my biggest and boldest life, so you can too. Get ready to leave behind societal expectations and embrace a life filled with laughter, joy, and endless possibilities. So stand tall, turn up the volume, and let's dive into the world of living life in full color. Together, we'll rediscover the power of being unapologetically ourselves, and we will release our inner vibrancy, and together, we will bring back our pink. Let's make every moment count, girls. Hello, lovely ladies, and welcome to this week's episode of Bring Back Your Pink. I am so excited with this week's guest. Josephine and I have met in a mastermind um, of Tina Towers, our amazing business coach, and we have connected over various things and a few glasses of champagne. But Josephine approached me to come on this podcast, and when I heard her story, I knew that she was the perfect guest. So let me tell you a little bit about her. Once, Josephine quietly existed on life's sidelines, you know, letting the world and its shadows shape her. But at 40, something shifted. She stepped out of those shadows and began anew, crafting a life not by circumstance but by choice. Now, the journey hasn't been without its trials. Speaking openly about her childhood marked by domestic violence has been both liberating and painful. It's a past that chipped away at her self-worth for years, and stole precious time that she could have spent exploring her potential. Yet, it's this very past that forged her resilience and her tenacity. She went from hardship and humble beginnings to successfully creating a multi-six-figure performing arts business fueled by passion, joy, and commitment. And don't we all want that, girls? You know my branding business is actually fueled by exactly the same thing. Today, she strides forward draped in vibrancy, and colour and wielding unapologetic confidence. You know this is why she's the perfect guest here. And the road is still unfolding, each step a testament to her growth. I am so excited to have you here. Thank you so much, Josephine. Thank you for coming on and welcome. Yay. It's always <laughs> funny sitting through the intro bio bit, but, you know, you get through it, you get through it. <laughs> oh, I know. Look, when I go on other podcasts, it's like, oh my gosh. You're talking about me, I actually sound yeah. like I'm really kind of good. <laughs> because you are bloody good, right? So well, yeah, thank you for having me so so much. I'm, I'm so excited to be here. I've been listening to your show and, um, yeah, it's been great. I'm really thrilled that you are because I believe that your story is going to help so many other ladies that mm. listen. Um, you know, I know my listeners quite well and this is not a topic, domestic violence is not a topic that we've touched on. Um, so, and you know, coming out the other end of that. And that's what this show is all about is, you know, reinventing ourselves and transformation. Yep. So I'm just so thrilled that you're here. But I'm going to start with question number one. <laughs> and, you know, this is this is something that's so close to my heart um, mm-hmm. is that transformation and realising that we are living in a dark place. And I want you to take us back to the moment that you decided to step out of the shadows and the grey world at 40 and reshape your life? What sparked that decision? Well, it actually started in that 38 to 39 slash 40 period. I started, you know, just really thinking about where I wanted to go and what I wanted to be. And I think for a lot of women, we lose ourselves, especially when we start having kids, you know, and I had my kids in my 30s and I still have young children now, six and eight. But there was that point where I was just like, I just don't feel like me. I'm yeah. not dressing like me. Even, and I know clothes are just a part of the physical um, statement that we make, but it is, it's all part of it. I mean, even just the fact that I was wearing all black because I didn't want to look fat or, you know, just oh my gosh. Like that. I feel and like, I just, Josephine, we are twinning right now. <laughs> I'm so, I was just over it, you know? Yeah. And it actually started, and and this is why, and I pitched myself to you to be on this podcast because I was listening to Amy from Confetti Rebels. Confetti Rebels. And I'm a, and I actually love wearing her stuff. And I started buying her stuff a couple of years ago, and I was really just wearing these outlandish statements on my t-shirt, or not that outlandish, but it felt like I was wearing my heart on my t-shirt, yeah. and. 
And I loved just going out. People would start making comments about it. You know, like, for example, if I'm too much, go find less. I have (laughs) that one. (laughs) And stuff like that. And people always stop and stare. And I just thought, yeah, you know, this is my personality. I'm an extrovert. And I I used to be, you know, an artist, a singer, was performing on stages in my youth. And and then I just lost it all. And that confidence shifted. But even when I was on those stages, I was still living it's almost like this false bravado when you're a performer because when you step on stage you're a rock star that's the that's the persona you step into but off stage I still was this unconfident uncertain human you know that's that that followed me all my life and only now I can honestly say that I've really just I'm starting to really find my true self and just be a little bit more unapologetic about it. But that, that's that been a really, really long journey. I mean, we're talking about from childhood trauma through to, yeah. you know, the rejection of being an artist yeah. through to real financial hardship, yep. uh, literally like living below the poverty line. Yep. And now being this woman who's sometimes you have to pinch yourself and go, wow, like, I've built this life and I just need to start stepping into it a little bit more. Yeah. Super proud of it and not be ashamed of it um, because that's what I grew up around. Like people that would say negative things about people that had money or success or, you know, they're a show off or if they're driving that car, they must be a drug dealer, you know, like these sorts of this narrative in your head that you have to fight against. And yeah, and I really feel that you know, I'm 40 now and almost 41. And I know there's people listening a variety of ages to your show, but this is where I'm starting to think I'm almost at the beginning of my life again. It's a weird thing, but I feel like I'm starting over. Yeah. So quite cool. Your journey is so similar to mine. And just listening to you then, I'm like, oh my gosh. And even the funny thing is, you know, when I started wearing Amy's shirts, shout out to Amy from Confetti Rebel guys. <laughs> When I started wearing them, it actually flipped me as well and gave me this confidence to be, you know, if I am too much, go find less. So I just love hearing that. And I love that to hear that you're doing it at, you know, an earlier age than I did. So, you know, my heart, I've actually got goosebumps because listening to you just talk then, you know, fills my cup so much. And I'm just so glad that you're here today. Um, And thank you again. Um, But discussing domestic violence you know, and, and that, that is your background is so brave. And, you know, how is sharing your experience, you know, helped your healing process and also your personal growth? So I didn't start talking about my experience with the people around me until I was in my late thirties. Um, I didn't talk about it. Me and my sisters didn't talk about it. It's like, it just didn't happen. We just pretended it didn't happen. That's how we went on. And, you know, I feel like that's no way to live. Once we started, I started a conversation with my sisters. That's where it started with family. And I'm like, this happened. And I'm like, yeah, it did happen. And we've been watering it down for many years. And then once I started having that conversation with family, I was like, okay, well now I remember I held a charity event through my performing arts studio because, you know, I am I have four studio locations in Sydney. I'm also a performing arts business coach, but I still have my studios um, at the moment. And a couple of years ago, I ran a charity event through my studio for Act for Kids, which raises money for children that come from abuse and neglect, which is what happened to me. I mean, I, you know, definitely was beaten as a child, but you know, my mother endured that as well from, you know, my dad. And I witnessed a lot of horrible things. And it was a really tense environment. Like you, you, you felt like you were walking on eggshells as a kid. Like if you got food out of the cupboard without permission and he was there, like, you know, you, you might get a whack, you know, so stuff like that. It was quite an intense environment. Um, But I held this charity event. And I was really proud of it. I was raising money for kids like me. And it was so special. And I remember I got on stage and I had to deliver a speech. This is to my studio community. These are the the families I serve, the people I serve. They've got no idea that I have any 
connection to the topic of this charity. Mm. I'm just running this charity event. And I just told my story on stage for some reason. It just, I just said it. And I told people that I was a person that came from a domestic abuse, you know, situation. And I started crying and I was like, oh my God, I've done, I've done it. Cat's out of the bag. <laughs> and I got off stage. My husband's like, oh, well done. That was really brave and you did a great job. And then people right. started coming up to me going, Joe, I was really moved by you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I remember seeing some of my young students in the audience going, oh, when I was talking, I didn't tell any detail. I just said it happened and they couldn't believe it. And I'm like, oh, it's weird how people can't believe it because it happens so often. It's just not talked about. We yeah. probably have so many friends and people within our network where it's just part of their their life. And and so to hear to see my students shocked, like 12 year old girls going, oh, they're shocked, you know, I mean, I'm glad for them. It means that they're not experiencing that and that's shocking to them. But yeah, it was really interesting. I thought, oh, well, I've done it now. I'm completely vulnerable. It's happened. Oh my God, hide me, hide me. But then people were really supportive and I thought, stuff it, cat's out of the bag. Then I went on to just going, okay, I don't talk about it like on social media publicly in that way. I'm not, I'm not there. <laughs> um, I don't think I have to ever be there. I don't, feel that that's necessary. I definitely bring it to my speaking engagements. I think that's something that people can really um, connect to from a resilience point of view. And, you know, people, sh- I can, I'm happy to share it on podcasts. And if it's shared in other ways, that's fine. I did write a chapter in um, the Women Changing the World uh, with through the Osmanpreneur Network. Yep. Um, and I shared my chapter in that and talked about my history in there. And that was quite therapeutic because I actually wrote my story. Yeah. Um, So that was quite a powerful exercise. And it's interesting, when I first talked about it, I was in tears and and broke down publicly. But now when I talk about it, it's like you just get stronger. You just get stronger. And I think that's the power of telling your true story it's the power of authenticity. It's the power of just being unapologetically you. It yeah. just gives you this empowerment. And, you know, and if that helps someone, then that's fantastic. But really, um, I love that it helps others, but this has been a self-healing journey for me. And yeah. so I've been telling my story because it helps me, you know. Yes. So yes. that, that's sort of that, um, how it came about. Yeah, <laughs> no, it really does. There, but that's how it came about. Sharing the story just it helps us inside so much as well, you know, and it does help us become and grow into being unapologetically, you know, who we were meant to be before life, you know, mm. sent us down a different path. But resilience, you know, obviously you are so resilient and, you know, it's throughout your life. Can you share some of the strategies that have helped you, um, you know, build the resilience to come out the other end and be who you are now? Totally. So resilience is one of my superpowers. Um, I am bloody resilient. I mean, to the point (laughs) where it's sometimes I have to remind myself that I don't have to be so tough all the time. Um, and I can release it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, But I love resilience. I teach my children resilience. And the power in resilience is through forgiveness. So I truly believe that there is a connection between forgiveness and strength. And the forgiveness is in, and, and I'm not saying that just because you forgive someone who's done a bad thing to you, and it doesn't have to be abuse it can be so many it can be in the workplace it can be yes. someone you know it doesn't matter what it is um but just being able to take yourself out of that situation and say i forgive you i love you and i'm sorry you know these are the things i say i forgive you i love you i'm sorry i'm sorry that it had to be this way even if it i can't connect to it's not necessarily i'm sorry i've done something wrong forgive me mm. it's you know i'm sorry that this is the way it is i'm sorry that 
you're hurting so much that you've had to do that to me or mm-hmm. whatever. So those are the the three steps that I go through in my forgiveness. It's a practice. Um, sometimes when I'm reminded of bad things that happened to me, I have to, t- I have to go through that breathing process and then go through the forgiveness again. Mm-hmm. Give you, I'm sorry. I love you. And I also say, thank you. Thank you mm-hmm. for the lessons that mm-hmm. this, this, this unfortunate circumstance has given me. Sometimes, you know, I mean, look, I I would never wish my childhood on anybody. I was out of home by the age of 14. Oh um, I would never wish my childhood on anybody. But, you know, there are days where I have to say thank you. Thank you for the lessons. Yeah. Because it's made me quite a strong, successful, powerful woman. Yes. Um, and to some people, it's the complete opposite. Some people, it really breaks them. Mm-hmm. So I'm really glad that it worked out the other way for me. I think for me, um, I was very fortunate to have a passion in music mm-hmm. and a passion for the arts. That to me is my saviour because even as a young teenager or someone who was 18 hanging out with, you know, people that weren't great, um, I knew that there was more for me. I knew that I loved this and I wanted to pursue it. So it was always in the back of my mind that the arts was going to be my career. It was going to be part of my life. And so there was more waiting for me, you know, and I think having a hobby or an interest or a passion is really important to get through that sort of that challenging moment in your life as well, because it's a deflection. Absolutely. when that happens, I know I can go to this. I can sing or I can go to a dance class or I can do, and it makes me feel good. So, you know, forgiveness absolutely is a part of my resilience strategy. Uh, also having having a deflection, having a hobby or something that you can go to, there's nothing wrong with having that distraction. Um, you don't always have to sit in it, you know. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> I am, um, you know, through my life, um when times were tough, I read. And yeah. see, for me, reading can take you to other places as well. So it can be literally, you know, if for those that are listening, um, <clears throat> you know, it doesn't have to be painting or dancing or singing. It can literally be as simple as reading and reading yeah. will just take you to another place. Um, but walking, walking, yeah, walking, walking, you know, listening to music, um, yeah. you know, so many simple techniques that, you know, can distract you from what's going on around you. But actually this kind of conversation has led to what I wanted to ask next as well. You know, you've built a successful six-figure business in the performing Mm -hmm. arts. You know, what motivated you to enter that field and what do you think are the key factors that have contributed to to being successful? Like for studios, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, look, I've done very well in this space and I think that, you know, that didn't come without challenges and lots of mistakes. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I invested in bad things, terrible business partners, you name it, I've done it. Um, I've also sat there in office jobs working at the reception or doing, I was once doing a traineeship in real estate. I mean, I don't want to do real estate, but, you know, you do these things. Um, I was working in a podiatrist's office. I've done all this stuff. And I just never was happy. I was sitting at that desk pining over what if, what if, what if. Uh And I just one day I remember I went up to my boss. I was in my little suit, you know, went up to my boss and I said, oh, I I just think I need to quit. And he's like, why are you doing so well? You know, (laughs) said I just I just want to sing I just want to (laughs) he probably thought I was an absolute nut job but Mm. I just thought I just I don't want to do this you know um and so I went and studied full-time in performing arts um and I just went and did it you know and look and I've had lots of jobs in between when I had my kids was when I decided to commit full-time to performing arts business Uh parents were business owners so I grew up around that I mean not to say they were brilliant business owners by any means but you know I was just always around that they were you know they had a bakery and they had a cafe and I was always sitting there you know after school and they'd be working and so I was used to that service business style Mm -hmm. Um, my sister my older sister she had her own business you know all of this so my family's always been very you know business orientated 
Um, but yeah, I was working for another organization at one point and I just remember thinking I could probably do this a bit better. <laughs> and so I went off and I tried and I loved it. I fell in love with it. But yeah, it wasn't until I, that I dabbled in business. It was always a side hustle. It was never the main event yep. because I didn't back myself. That's without a doubt. I did not back myself as a business owner or entrepreneur until I had my first child. And I thought, I just knew I wanted some flexibility, a different lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I was sick of the grind. And I thought, what if I could do this full time, create a lifestyle that I choose and make time for this new family that I'm creating? And so with a baby on my hip, literally a baby on my hip, um, I think she was only less, I think she was four to six months old when I opened up the studio. I was just adamant I wanted to do it I had no clients I went and got a commercial lease Mm -hmm. um it was the crappiest place you ever did see Mm -hmm. and we turned that mutton into lamb yep and I just I started with 12 students and now I've got hundreds of students um and now I you know coach other studio owners how to create their own thriving successful profitable studio business um, yeah, it's amazing the transformation. And I still get that little high of that performance adrenaline because I'm a performer. I love to perform. Yeah. I actually do get that sort of energy from speaking and actually using my social media. Talking to camera is not a problem for me. Yeah, um, yeah. Going live is not a problem for me. That's super comfortable. Um, but yeah, so I still can get that through different avenues. Like, so I find that to be quite interesting. Yeah, so so that's how it kind of started. I just thought I'm a mum now and I want to get moving and not go back to the the office job environment. Yeah. It just wasn't for me. So it's only, how old is your business? About eight years old then? Um, nearly 10 years old, 10 years so old okay. almost that's... a decade. I've been running, I've had a business, I've, that's what I mean. So I've always dabbled. I've dabbled, dabbled yeah, in okay. business for two decades, but I never, it, I never took it seriously. Yep. And part of that actually was because a lot of the people around me didn't really view it as a business. Yeah. So because I was in the arts, I was always a hobby business. Yes. And so if I told someone at a party, for example, oh, what do you do? Oh, I've got a dance studio, for example. Oh, that's cute. Mm-hmm. No. Like, it's like, well, no, it's a real thing, but I didn't believe it was a real thing. I had yes. to actually um, remove myself from a lot of the people that were surrounding me for many years. And yeah. Just, dance studio is a hard yakka. My daughter danced for a number of years. Yeah. And it is hard yakka. How yeah. old were you when you started, you know, singing and dancing and, you know? Oh, and gosh. I mean, I've been doing this since I was little, but, um, I mean, I was always in the school play and yeah. sort of things like that. Like I've always been into it. Always. I love that. I love that so much. So, you know, talking about coaching and speaking engagements, how has your past shaped your approach to both of those? So I'm very conversational. I like to be a realist and I always come in um, through storytelling. I think storytelling is the most powerful tool when I'm speaking mm-hmm. uh, and I inter- and I inject story throughout the presentation. So even if it's a dry topic, like let's talk about the top 10 marketing tips for your studio biz. And we'll be going through them. And then I inject story like in the middle saying, okay, so I once did this and this is what happened to me in my experience. And and I think that's how I keep people engaged and connected. Um, One, I get get this quite a bit from my coaching clients because, you know, you send out feedback forms and why do you you choose me? Why do you choose me? And uh, quite a few have said is because they just find me relatable, real, those those sorts of words pop up quite frequently and I'm good with that. I mean, I was saying to you, funnily enough, before jumping on this call and hitting mm. record, you know, I had someone interview me for a podcast this week and they were surprised that I was an American based mm-hmm. on what they've seen on social media. Um, I find that really interesting. But I think it's just because I, I share the wins as well. I think in sometimes in an Australian um, business landscape, we're afraid to share the wins. I agree. It's the tall poppy syndrome, you know. 100%. And that's actually what I was going to say. 
Americans, I know they celebrate success. They celebrate, you know, themselves and uh, Australians tend to be more reserved um, mm. and more, you know, yeah. Um, well, yeah, tall poppy syndrome is a real thing, isn't it? Totally. Um, I definitely believe in showing up unapologetically myself and I didn't always do that, but I do think it's important. And you know what? Like I do, don't get me wrong. When I first started doing it within the last 12 months, really is when I stepped into, stepped into color online in life, all of it. And, you know, I've got my pom-poms out. I don't care. I'm having fun. And it's not like I'm putting on a show. It isn't, there's an element of, you know, showmanship, but uh, it is me. You know, I'm not feeling forced. You know, and I I love that so much because in my branding business, you know, that's what I teach my clients. And I try and be the same as well because I'm laughing when you say you have your pom-poms out. In my last launch, I was out there shaking my pom-poms, popping champagne. And, you know, look, the thing is too, you know, life is short. We need to make it fun, you know, and we do need to be unapologetically ourselves and yeah look it takes time there's no doubt about it It takes time and maturity I think to really know who you are um and be unapologetic about it but it's actually interesting because you know you know I have I have questions um that I wrote down and the next one I was going to ask you actually is what does unapologetic confidence mean to you and how do you practice it like every day well, I think it just means no it's a knowing that I'm yeah. being true to myself <clears throat> and if I and also it's about trying very hard not to look at the competitor and emulate them because if I do that I'm not being true to myself and that can be hard because sometimes I will look at my competitors in in the performing arts business landscape and I will see that that particular coach and that coach and that coach and all the coaches are wearing you know suits and the beige suits and the black suits and and that there's nothing wrong with that because that may be exactly who they are but it's not me and I just feel you know to be unapologetically myself may be a risk because I am unique in my space there's really no one like me in my space that is for sure Mm -hmm. and that is a risk but it has to be a risk I'm willing to take because I figure that surely the right people will just be attracted to me and that and that will take time to build and you know like that woman said are you american you know it's like okay well you know maybe i'm meant to attract an american audience it doesn't matter if, if the people that are meant to come to me because of who i am will come to me over time um and then i have to trust in that and not suffer from comparisonitis yeah, and the so whole imposter syndrome thing, you know, all of us in business, we all know how that feels. But I have a saying that I love to, and I feel like I'm going to get it actually printed on a shirt for myself. Um, <laughs> I may not be everyone's cup of tea, but I'm sure as heck someone shot a vodka. Yeah, totally. So, and-, and I think that's a really good way for us all to live, knowing that not everyone is going to like us, and that is perfectly okay. Yeah, and it can and it can be upsetting sometimes at first because when, especially when when you start showing up unapologetically yourself, yep. there's going to be people that know you or think they truly know you that look down upon you. Um, I believe I lost a friendship over it. To be honest, um, someone that I was close to for twenty years just ghosted me and stopped talking to me once I started showing up online. I do very much believe that it's based on the way I show up and there's nothing wrong with how I show up. It's just, they're just not used to seeing me in that way. And this is what I mean about like, you know, growing up, I I was around a lot of people that struggled financially or had these sorts of, you know, even in my 20s, you know, it was all about starving artists, you know, all this stuff, the narrative that we were fed. Once I started moving away from that and having a more abundance mindset, I noticed people moving away from me um from those circles yeah and so that was a little bit painful at first I'm I tried to understand it you know why why would they not want to talk to me and then I started like not wanting to talk like if I was um out for lunch with them you know I might have a cleaner once a fortnight and they're still on struggle street and I might and I don't want to mention the cleaner because they'll judge me I can't have a cleaner that's wrong that's wrong to have a cleaner that's selfish or do you know what I mean that's the all. narrative that was going through my head. And I thought, yeah. and I started catching myself feeling like I couldn't talk 
the way, like I couldn't talk about buying a house or, you know, once you start stunting those conversations, yeah. not saying that having materialistic things is the conversation, we would talk about real things, but I felt like I had to suppress my success. Oh, there we go. That rhymes. I had to suppress my success. That should be on a t-shirt. Don't su- suppress your success. <laughs> We need to start a t-shirt company. Oh, that's going to be a new t-shirt. Um, yeah, don't suppress your success. You shouldn't have to around friends. No, you shouldn't. Once that starts happening and they start not wanting to talk to you anymore, you know, you know, it's it's time to move on. And and I've had to adopt the um, the saying, some friendships are either what is it for a lifetime, a se- a reason, a season, season or yeah. a lifetime. Yep. So now I just go, okay, so that wasn't a lifetime. That was for a season or that was for a reason. We needed each other when we were struggling in dance college together and eating 10 cent noodles that, and couldn't pay our rent, you know, yes. like that was that moment and we needed each other. But that that that's now past or that was a seasonal thing. We used to party together and that was super fun, but now we don't party together anymore and we've actually got nothing to talk about. It was just about the party. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know, and so that was a season, you know, so and that comes with maturity and age as well, just accepting those relationships, what they are. And that doesn't mean I hate those people or if they oh. called me, I'd pick up the phone. It's not that. It's not that we're not friends. It's just the dynamic of the relationships have changed. Yeah. And it sounds so, and this is where that uh, that mindset, that money mindset, and I'm still working on it today. Like mm. I do, I have a multi six-figure business. I, you know, I'm, I'm a homeowner. I have, you know, I've gone away three times this month. Mm. You know, you saw me, you, we were trying to organize yeah. the podcast and I like to send you a photo of me. Yeah, that's and it. I up with a cocktail and I'm like, yeah. And you're like, woohoo, that's the energy I'm surrounding myself now, the woohoos, because I can't yeah. feel bad about that. And that sounds a little bit conceited. I don't know. Does it? Does it sound? No, so not not at all. Not know. at all, because it, it's interesting that you, you talk about that, because this is the, the energy I surround myself with as well. And yeah. um, I mean, I'll use an example just recently that when we went to New Zealand, um, I wanted to fly on Emirates. I've never been on Emirates. Mm. And my husband has a business and he works with Australia Post and he spends a lot of money with them each month and he puts it all in his Amex. We have so many points. So we use our points to fly to New Zealand first class, you know. Love it. Uh, and it was amazing. Like, and I shared it on my socials because, you know what, I knew the people on my socials and, you know, on my Instagram feeds are going to embrace that. There's friends that I did not tell that we did that. You know, various friends because yeah it's like oh am I am I showing off um you know yeah no, so it's, it's that fine line isn't it and that's a very I, fine line yeah and I think it's important to balance your social media to your audience as well <clears> like <throat> I, I I am mindful of that but at the same time you know I don't need to share every detail of my life online <laughs> but I do want to share some stuff and yes. that's me putting my feet up in cans on a on a weekday you know percent and what we want to show people and you know this is like you know, a bit of a business conversation but what yeah. we want to show people too is if if we can do it anybody can that's exactly you know, what i'm we're, saying yeah we're no one special we're 100%. just determined people that have a vision yeah. and that go towards that vision you know and focus on it and you and, don't even have to be rich that's the other bit you just have to make a decision that's and- it And that's what I love so much. And that's what I'm sharing with my community because the studio owners that I serve, a lot of them are on Struggle Street or they're like still debating after 20 years of business if they should have an admin assistant. And I'm like, get yourself an admin assistant, please, right now. (laughs) Go and do it. You deserve it. You've done this for 20 years. You don't have to work every Sunday and Saturday. You don't. No, you don't. (laughs) And so those conversate and I'll and I'll say those conversations are ones that I share with my community and the people that connect with me, they know where I come from. So they appreciate where I am now. And I actually will say that. Hey, and I'll even do a little story. Hey, studio owners, it's a weekday and I'm here in Cairns taking two days off from my business and trusting in team 
to, to, you know, run the ship while I'm gone because it's possible. If I can do this, believe me, you can too. It's yep. just about making the decision and that bold, big leap into trusting that you can do this and you don't have to be in control of every detail of your business. You can let go a little, relinquish the control. Yeah. You don't have to employ a full-time person. I've said to my te- um to my coaching pe- um you know clients, I call them teams, see, because that's how I view them. Um, I've said to my coaching clients, you know, like just get them in for a few hours a week. Let's start Please. with five, six hours a week. Let's just just ease the burden, see how it feels. And chances are it's going to free you up for more revenue generating activity because right now you're so in the business, you can't see your way out of it, right? So those sorts of little things. Um, And I don't believe in overstaffing either. I think there's a fine line again. But just start small. Start small and get the support you need. And that's the only reason I can do what I do. I have three businesses, Jen. I've got a talent agency. I've got my studio, which has four locations, and I've got my coaching business. And there is no way <laughs> I could do that if I was teaching all the classes, yes. you know, doing all the admin, the bookkeeping, you know, if I was the, no. what is it? The the butcher, the baker and the candlestick maker, there is no way I could do it all. Yes. And some people say, oh my God, Joe, how do you do it all? And it's like, it's really simple. I have a plan. I have I do structure my week. I have a scheduled plan. Mm-hmm. I follow it and I and I lean on team. And I have to trust in team. Yeah. And even if they're at 80% of what I would do, there's no doubt. Look, I went into one of my classes the other day because one of my teachers was away. And one of the parents came up to me, but I don't teach anymore. But what they came up and said, oh, my God, that class was amazing. Are you going to come back next week? Like, you're the best. And I'm like, no, I'm not. No. <laughs> No. But I, you know, and my teachers do a great job, but mm. they're not as passionate as me. I mean, it's my business. Of it's course. Just, but you know what? 80% is okay. So mm. I think if you adopt that mindset that your team, if they hit 80 to 90% of you, of your personal yeah. ability, you're doing okay. Yeah. And you know what? I love that we were talking about unapologetic confidence. We've gone to team, but you're now unapologetically talking about you know, your team, that you have team, you know, yes. that you embrace your team. And, you know, it's interesting because a, a lot of business owners that I've met over the years, you know, kind of hide their team in some way. It's like, you know, they, they don't want to talk about how much team they have. And see, that's a big step, you know, for you unapologetically saying, I have team, couldn't do without them. Oh, I've them got a cleaner. Up. Yeah, I have a cleaner. I have that's a cleaner. part of that's my team. Business. I tell you. Yeah. The cleaner is part of my team because that the stress of cleaning my house is so overwhelming that every time the cleaner comes, and it's only once a fortnight, by the way, something crazy, but they do the big stuff. And I know for all the clean freaks who mop every day and scrub their bathrooms that they can't handle this, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I'm good with fortnight. And, um, and of course we keep the house tidy and all the things, but the, the deep clean stuff happens fortnightly. Thank God. I actually don't remember the last time I picked up a mop. And I know that's going to be really ouch for some people, but it's actually not even that expensive. It's uh, it's it's like I say to my husband, the cleaner keeps us married. Okay. <laughs> I said I am all for that. I have um what we call it, like she's our housekeeper. And at the moment she's coming once a week, much to my dismay. I would prefer her twice a week. Um, because my next big goal. To I was gonna say, whilst I, whilst I don't have children in the house, I have ten cats. Mm. They make as much mess. Yeah, it's totally. Awful. So you know, like, there's a lot of cleaning here, and yeah. you know, yeah. And I'm very unapologetic about it. I talk about her openly because, yeah, it keeps us married. Yeah, I, I reckon it truly does because the biggest argument we were having was over household domestic duties and it was taking away from our weekends. And yeah. I said, this is dumb. Like we are already working, like we're hardworking folk and we have these weekends available to us. I want to enjoy them with you. I don't want to be worried about, oh, my God, I didn't scrub the bathtub. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, totally. But it, actually, 
now this kind of leads into a next question and maybe it was higher in the cleaner um but can you share a particular moment or turning point you know when you felt that you had fully stepped into the world of color and joy and unapologetic living yeah so I reckon um when you said that I have no prepared response for this but the thing that popped into my head immediately Mm -hmm was this dress I bought and it was from um, my little party dress stop. Oh, my God, that was me too. Oh, my God. (laughs) Uh, It's like we're soul sisters right now. Um, Yeah, so I went onto that website. I remember an ad popped up and it was this the most outlandish, vibrant, rainbow dress it was so loud it wasn't and the robot dress was it no 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 I I mean I don't even know it's just the rainbow rainbow color. robot no no this was a, like splashes of bold color yeah and I just remember going I like that dress so much could I wear it and I thought yeah like I can I can wear whatever the F I want <laughs> and I bought the dress and I wore it and actually, the first time, I think one of the first times I've wore it was to one of Tina Towers' events. Mm-hmm. It was actually a book launch. And um, they got me, I asked a question and, sat, and they complimented the dress. I said, yes, I've made a decision to step into colour this year. And everyone started applauding me in the room. And I thought, these are my people. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I just didn't feel like it was too much anymore. I was like, it's not too much. It's fun and I love it. And this dress just represents who I am inside. It's not about the dress. It's about me being this vibrant, colourful human, you know, that just feels like I can't be myself because so many people tell me I'm too much. I've gotten that my whole life. Too oh, much of this. Too much. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh, I'm really over that narrative and I don't even believe it anymore. I actually don't believe I'm too much. I think no. my too muchness it's your is your superpower. It's a superpower because 100%. it is the vibrant personality that keeps me showing up every day and continuing to try. It makes me market better online because I just show up. You know, I'll show up without makeup. I'll show up however I am. I don't need to have all the bells and whistles. It just means that inside I have this vibrancy and confidence that I'm going to show up. And and I love that. And I think if you don't love it, then, like, you're just not my people anymore. Yeah. And it can make people feel really uncomfortable. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's important, like, I think when I was younger, because I was such an angry person from what I'd been through and I hadn't moved through those emotions, it used to come out aggressive. So yeah. instead of vibrant energy, which is the too muchness now, it was an angry, mm-hmm. aggressive energy. I was short with people. I was, yeah. I was just angry. Um, and so I can understand that that would have been too much to deal yeah. with. I get that. I can see that in reflection. I had to learn pretty quickly in my 20s that if I wanted people, if I wanted to manage people, if I wanted to work with people or lead people, because it wasn't about managing, it was about a lead. I always was in a role of leadership in everything I did, even in my band. I was always the leader of, you know, it was just the way I always was, you know, let's do this, let's do that. I've booked this, you know. If I wanted people to to come with me on any journey or any project, I had to be, I had to persuade them in a way that was encouraging Mm -hmm. um, and I couldn't demand it. That didn't work. I wasn't like, you're, you know, because when I was young, I was always right. And so it was like, you're wrong and I'm right. This is the way, you know, and that didn't work. But once I started going, okay, I see what you're seeing mm-hmm. and I I acknowledge that. And I actually think there is great ideas in there. How can we collaborate on this so that both of us walk away feeling really good about this project? Mm-hmm. And I think it's a totally different mindset, but it is about, yeah, the too muchness now is 
happy, energetic, extroverted energy. I'm happy with that. I'm good with that. If that's too much for you, go fun less. Yep, go when I was it. younger, it was a totally different vibe. It, well, it, I, I can admit now in maturity, when you look back, right? Yeah, yeah. Now you can see, like, I can see why that person didn't want to work with me. I was yeah. too forceful with my idea. I didn't allow them to contribute. Um, that That would be too much. Yes. Mm. This kind of leads on to something else I did want to ask you because it sounds like, you know, in your bio you said you felt like you've lost years of your potential. Mm. And this, what you're describing there sounds actually like those were the lost years um, when you were, you know, feeling like not your joy and, you know, too muchness but were kind of diverting it into something else, you know. What advice would you give to someone that, you know, has lost these years of of potential because we've been living in the dark and, you know, um, due to past trauma or hardship. Yeah, I think this is a really, really um, good thing that you're bringing up here, good question, because I often felt like I'd lost a decade of my life Yeah, to the trauma to the wasting of time to not doing enough not being enough not um, using my full potential but it's interesting because I now know that those were part of the lessons and the journey of my life yes and without them I wouldn't be where I am today that's it and so it's all you got to forgive yourself. Back to the forgiveness piece. You have to yeah. just forgive yourself. It's okay. You know, I am exactly where I'm meant to be. That's the key. That's the affirmation that I do remind myself. I am exactly where I'm meant to be. And I have lots of years ahead. Yes. So now my goal is to just, if I can keep myself healthy, um, you know, move more, eat, eat um, well, you know, I'm not talking about body image. I'm talking about health and well-being meditation go to a retreat feel good see friends read more you know that sort of thing um if i can keep my mind and body healthy um then i will have another 40 years or more ahead of me you'll make up those years i am a baby of life you know even if you're 50 60 yep there's still so many years to go like the best years are just beginning i so believe it like you know, it's interesting because I've got um, some people I know that are in their 50s, um, you know, family, friends, and I can see they've given up like, oh, I'm too yeah. old for this or yeah. oh, I'm feeling sore, too old, I can't go. And I'm thinking, dude, you're 55. No, we just <laughs> get off know, the couch and go. Mean, I mean, that's my age. And yeah. for me, I, I yeah, and my husband is the same. He's 62. And we're just like, let's get out there. There's so much more that we've got to live and so much more life to have. And, you know, as your children grow up and you are empty nesters, you know, it's just the two of you and you can just go out and live and have fun. And you know what? Maybe you get a little bit more tired, you know, like I might go, oh, I'm tired, I'm going to bed early. But, you know, the next day we're up and ready and, like, don't let life pass you by and don't let, you know, yes, we've lost years. You know, you've lost years. I lost years. Um, But it's like. I wouldn't, we wouldn't be here right now doing what we love so much and being who we are and being so unapologetically ourselves if it wasn't for those past traumas and hardships. So you just got to journey through it. That's it. That's the key. Forgive yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, You got to feel grateful, I guess. Yeah. um, For the the hardship. Um, I had a moment at a retreat just recently and, um, you know, my ex husband, was difficult and made life difficult and all of a sudden I was at this retreat and we were sort of reflecting and I'm like I just felt this overwhelming rush of gratitude to him because I'm like you know what if if we hadn't have separated and divorced and if things hadn't happened that happened I wouldn't be here right now in this place living this life Mm. it was like an absolute from my toes right up this overwhelmed rush of gratitude and sometimes that is that that thank you piece that I was saying before I thank you it's not that you forgive them per se in the sense that it's okay to treat me badly it's okay no that's not what we're saying yeah 
just, you know, thank you for that experience because this is the lessons I've learned and now I'm grateful for it because I'm here. And it, all of that can sound really naff, but once you embody that, it actually works. True. This has been the most amazing chat. I have one last question to ask Amazing. You. Mm-hmm. In your journey, uh, what have you found to be the most I, I guess, effective way to inspire and motivate others, you know, that are on a similar path, you know, of overcoming, of being who they were meant to be, of transformation? What advice would you give them, you know? You've just got to back yourself 100%. No one's coming to save you. Okay, that's that's the resilience talking. No one's coming to save you. No one's going to do the work for you. No, but you know, you might have loved ones surrounding you that are supportive, but at the end of the day, it comes down to you and you must back yourself. And the way to do that is to deeply know why you've chosen what you've chosen, what the decision you're making, whatever that may be. Why do you want it? And and like there'll be superficial reasons why, but the real deep core of your why. And I know that's something that a lot of people in our industry will say, a lot of coaches and mentors, but it's it's said for a reason. 100%. Because once you tap into that why, um, for me, I know that I didn't have the resources growing up to pursue what I wanted. It's like that, like I said, the wasted potential, right? Yeah. Um, but you know, for me, I just want to create, I want to make the arts accessible to everyone that wants to be a part of it. I Mm. want them to find joy in the passion of arts, because I know that that is what really did save my life. Truly, I believe it. And if I can pass that baton to others so that they can continue to nurture their children and give them the power of and the passion of the arts to the next generation, then I am, that's my legacy. I am continuing that story. I want my children, you know, to have a great life, one that is not fueled by abuse, neglect. I want them to feel loved, you know, like these are my whys. I want them to feel safe and secure and not go through financial hardship like I did, um, you know, and these these are my whys. They are deep core seeded whys. It took me a while to get there. At first it was because I want to live on the beach, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't live on the beach yet Jen (laughs) it's coming (laughs) one day even if I I said to my husband even if we get an apartment on the beach when we retire I'm good with that (laughs) and doesn't have to be in the in you know Sydney either it could be anywhere just on the water um so you know stuff like that but just knowing deeply your why and then whenever you're feeling that little voice inside of you that again is is doubting yourself, which will continue, 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 continue. Every single week it's going to pop in your head. Yeah. Right? Um, and it gets better. And and that's the back yourself component. I go back to what I call my why list, which is these are my whys. These are my core whys. I don't have to read them anymore because I intrinsically know them. Yeah. But until you know them, write them down, your top whys of why you want to do what you want to do, the decision you're making. And they can change. That's okay. You don't have to be, you know, stubborn to them. You can evolve. But the point is, yeah, it's that backing yourself component and just tapping into your own self and really discovering why you want to do what you want to do. I think that's it. I think that's that's the power of it, you know. Thank you so much. This has been such a great chat. Um, I do believe there is so much gold in here for the ladies that are listening and you know so much great advice you know on how to get out there and you know literally live your best life because that's what we all want you know we all want to live our best lives so thank you so much for coming on Um, Um, I will say as well for anyone listening if you do want to connect with me if I could share my Instagram because I'd love you to jump on and say hi and feel free to DM me Um, but yeah follow me online Instagram's my play my place place you know I like to have a bit of fun there Um, and that's just at Josephine Lane Cuba which is probably a bit hard to spell but I'm sure she'll she'll give you all there'll be all the links and that's something I always forget which thank you for reminding me it's like (laughs) Where can people find you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you can head to my website, josephinelancuba.com. And, um, you know, I offer performing arts coaching, uh, but also 
general speaker opportunities, you know, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. Um, I've spoken for corporate industry. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm a great, um, you know, speaker, live presenter, and that's something that I work in professionally as well. So if that's something that interests you, absolutely reach out. Please do because she's the bomb. (laughs) Anyway, thank you, ladies, for listening, and I will see you next week on Bring Back Your Pink. And don't forget, girls, go out and live life in full colour. We only have one, so don't don't waste it. (laughs) Hey, ladies, I created this podcast because I know we need more of it to help us bring back our pink and live our best lives but guess what we can't do this alone so if you loved this episode let's spread the world share it on your socials send it to a friend and don't forget to write us a review by doing this you become part of the movement to bring back your pink and inspire others to do the same i'm incredibly grateful to have you in my world as we live life in full color and become our authentic selves together we're unstoppable Let's keep rocking and bringing back the pink.